He moves from there. I'm still in the text. And he starts to explain to them about how if you get some new clothes, you don't attach it to an old garment. He says, in other words, watch this one. He was trying to get the paper ready for a new administration. Tell somebody, say, God's trying to get you ready for some new things. Yeah, I'm prophesying right there. You're trying to stick with some old stuff, and God's trying to get you ready. Then he tells them, no man that invests in wine takes his new wine, one translation uses the illustration uh, and puts it in old wine skills. The translation we're looking at tonight used the term bottles because he says, now that new wine, it's going to have some yeast in it. I'm explaining it to you. And the yeast is going to rise. And the old container can't hold the new wine that God wants to pour. All this is prophetic. See, because see, when you begin to increase, have you ever noticed when your life really starts to increase, you start running out of room with stuff around you? So in other words, say this with me, I must get prepared for expansion. Not only, not only, not only, not only for expansion, but he says preservation. Because it was all about preserving what was about to be poured. Hmm. Watch this, I'm going a little bit further. Then when he gets there, he said he explains to them the importance of recognizing his presence. He explains to them the importance of change and process. He relates it to clothes and bottles. Then we get to our text of study. Both chapters, all three gospel writers stop at this same point and they say there was a certain man, a ruler of the synagogue. Now, I, 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 I already read the text so for the sake of time, I probably won't be going back and forth like if we was on a Sunday morning. Y'all all right with that? Because you already know the text. The man, I believe they pointed out that he was a ruler of the synagogue to let you know that God is no respecter of person. Now, J.R. had come to him, and, and then, then we had these two situations. One is a man with a sick child. Now, he's not coming and praying on his own behalf, but he's coming to Jesus on the behalf of someone else. Right. Now, now, right when J.R. says, get God's attention, here comes this woman that has an issue of blood. Bible says, Bible says that Jesus said, come on, I'm going to go to your house and heal her. Soon as he gets ready to start moving in his direction, the woman comes and catches Jesus' attention. Now watch this. What I like about that is that means when God working on my situation, he's not so limited that he can't handle both of them at the same time. Look at somebody and say, take the limits off God. One of them is on the behalf of another, and the other is on the behalf of herself. In either situation, both of these people got what they were expecting. I want to ask you tonight, what are you expecting from God? You know, we, we've been teaching on families, and I told you when we get into it, we're going to start talking about roles and expectations. I believe, just like Robert Jr. said last night, probably said night. Most people don't receive from God because they don't expect nothing. All right. All right. They go to church, go through the same old routine, same old mundane things, and, and, and instead of us coming really hungry for God, really seeking for a move of God and expecting God to move, we come with a positive attitude. And I mean, you know, whatever I sow, that's what I'm going to read. So until I learn to change my attitude towards God and the things of God, a lot of things that I'm believing God for will steady be on hold. 
The Bible talks about how God wants to give us all things freely and also richly to enjoy. So now it means God don't want you running around like you a stiff shirt. You too sanctified to have a good time. Come on right down, right, right down through here. See, you can look at somebody because there is life after church. Amen. Just like the man of God said, it's time to pray, but also after we get through praying, it's time to get up and do some things. And the more I learn that God wants me to enjoy myself, I mean, you know, on this side of heaven, on this side of heaven, this is the only place we're going to do a whole lot of things. Because when we get to glory, the only thing we're going to be caught up with then will be 24-hour worship. So people that live in this dispensation of time that have a problem worshiping and praising God, they ain't ready to go to heaven. Folk that have a problem getting up, getting ready to come to church, they not ready. See, Horace and this woman, two examples, two different people. Glory, praise the Lord. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go with me to Psalms 37 verse 4. Go with me to Psalms 37 Verse 4, now, now for a second time, while you're going, I'm going to tell you just like this. Y'all hear me say this all the time on a regular schedule basis, that for the most part, the devil's job has always been to make it seem like the word of God is not going to come to pass in your life. I told you my, my basic take on the garden scene when Eve talks to him in Genesis chapter 3 they, they get into this conversation and say, God lied to you. God has you blind. And he's keeping something from you. So all throughout time now, he's trying to get believers to lose confidence in God. But watch Psalms 34. Is that 37 verse 4? Read that for me. Ready to read. See, so now, one of the first things I have to do is I have to make an adjustment within myself. Because if I'm going to get what I expect from God, I, listen, God has to become my delight. Not a part time. I got to want to pray. I got to want to read my Bible. Now, and I understand more than any of you may think I understand. Your flesh doesn't ever want to do anything spiritual. So that's why I have to discipline my flesh until I make myself get adjusted to desiring the things of God. Because the Bible says, he that hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. Y'all don't believe, but I'm almost through. Watch this. We're going to examine these two people. First of all, first of all, let's look at the first case. Let's look at the first case. First one, here's their problem. Watch this. He was looking at a dead situation. Literally in the book of Matthew, it says when he came to Jesus, in Matthew's interpretation, he said, he say, my daughter's already dead. Yeah. But if you come and lay your hands on her, she'll live. How, how many of you looking at some dead situations? See, it's not over till God says it's over. And what you have to understand is everything in the kingdom you have to qualify for. So if you're up against a dead-looking situation, you're perfect for Jesus to resurrect some stuff. Yeah. Ain't, ain't nobody in here but me. I, I know y'all waiting on the hoop. But if you're facing, a, I don't care what it is, it could be some, some business. It could be your relationships. It could be on your job. But if it looks hopeless and it looks like there's no more life in it, just wait a while. And like the prophet said Monday night, God's getting ready to breathe on your situation. Oh, ain't nobody in here. Turn, tell three people, say, I'm telling you, God's about to breathe on your situation. Some of y'all already starting to experience some of the breath of God. God's been bringing a fresh wind, giving you new ideas, giving you new concepts, giving you a new romance in your household. Why? Because God's breathing on your dead situation. 